Praise the Lord, church. Do I got anyone that's glad to be in the house of the Lord once again? Amen. I'm going to invite everyone to stand to their feet this morning. Amen. How many know that you serve a God that's been good to you? How many know that you serve a God that takes care of your needs? Amen. You serve a God that woke you up this morning. You serve a God that started you on your way. I'm wondering if someone could just take a few moments to reflect on the God that they serve. We serve a God that died for us. We serve a God, amen, that was crucified, that bled for us, but rose on the third day, amen. I am redeemed because of my God. I have been set free because of my God. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me at this time. Come up to the front if you want to. We're just going to clap a little bit and sing these songs. Amen. We're going to talk about God's goodness.
I'm wondering if for a few moments someone can clap their hands in this place. Come on. See, I'm so glad that when I woke up this morning, I knew I was on my way to an apostolic church. That this is a church that is still pumping. This is a church that is still alive. This is a church that still knows how to call on the name above every other name. I don't know what it is, amen, but I feel like we gotta shout a little bit. I feel like we gotta dance a little bit. Here we go. One, two, three. that knows that you serve a God that is in control. You got a God that is fighting your battles. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody proclaim the name of Jesus where you're at. Proclaim the name of Jesus right there in your situation.
Come on, somebody call on the name of Jesus. I don't want to move if he's not in it. I don't want to sing if you're not in it. I don't want to talk if you're not in it. Lord, would you have your way in our service? I know you're still working things out in my life, Lord.
help me say I know you're working I know you're working in all things in all things I know you're working I know you're working I know you're working in all things I love that your in word reassures things. me in every area of my life I know you're working I know Sunday tithes and offerings this morning, amen. As our ushers come forward at this time. that have been going to youth camps, been going on vacation, amen, that they are coming back home safely. It is so great to see, amen, the people of God in the house of the Lord, amen. Vodius Church, amen. This year is flying by. We're having a blessed time. Amen. I know in, in the month of Vodius, we have a few events going on. We have our Young Adults Volleyball Tournament. Amen. Do I got any young adults that are excited about volleyball? Amen. I got one young adult that's excited about volleyball. Praise God. Amen. 
Amen. We have um, our ladies' conferences. We are just so blessed. Amen. As the church stands at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand. As we turn the remainder of this service over to our assistant pastor, Pastor Ray Barunda. Praise the Lord, everyone. I said, praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening? I said, how many are glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Does anybody in this place got joy? I said, does anybody got joy? Woo. I wonder sometimes, sometimes we walk into the house of the Lord and we're worried about everything else except Jesus. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I know it's hot. It's all right. It's okay to be hot. But how many know that God is worthy of the praise? I said he's worthy of the praise. I wonder if we can just for no reason at all shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. He's worthy of the praise. I said has God been good to somebody in this place that you know he's worthy of the praise. God has brought somebody a mighty long way. I said he's picked you up and turned your life around. He gave you a brand new way of walking. He gave you a brand new way of talking. He gave you a brand new way of acting. Somebody shout with the voice of triumph. I said come on and shout with the voice of triumph. Amen. I know that today God has something very special for us. There's not a time that we can ever fear that we walk into the house of the Lord and we anticipate something from God that God isn't going to meet that need. So if there's somebody here that needs salvation, God has come here to see you. Amen. If there's somebody in this place that needs to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, God has come here to see you. If there's someone that needs a miracle in this place, God has come here to see you. If there's somebody here that needs to know how you're going to make it another day, God has come here to see you. Amen. But you got to act like you want it. And you got to believe that it's going to happen. You serve a God that doesn't fail. You serve a God that doesn't fall short. Amen. So today we have something very special. But first we want to remind everybody to keep our pastor in your prayers. He's on vacation. And I know right now he's probably thinking about the fuss that it's going to take to get back over here. Amen. But we pray that God keep him, protect him and his family and bring him home safely. Also, keep in mind all those things that God is working on. There are many people right now that are getting home Bible studies, that are developing a relationship with God. There are many people that are battling with sickness and affliction. Keep them in your prayers and in your minds. And more than anything, keep your heart open to what the word of the Lord has to bring us today. Amen. Are y'all ready? I said, are y'all ready? I said, are you all ready? Okay. We're going to welcome our preacher for today, Brother Chris Salas, as he comes forward to bring forth the word. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we give that up to the Lord? Come on, we can do better than that. I understand if that was for me, amen. And I think our God deserves a round of applause like no other. The word of God says to so make a joyful noise, all you people. Make a joyful noise, all you people. Hallelujah. I'm 
so excited to be in the house of the Lord. There's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. Amen. What a wonderful time we are having. What a wonderful worship. What a wonderful praise. Thank God for our praise team that sings with power, that sings with anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. I don't want to keep you standing long. At first, I'd just like to give thanks, of course, unto my God for being so good to me. His mercy and his grace is uh, its unspeakable at times. It's unspeakable joy that you have and just an appreciation where you don't have many words, but just to lift up your hand and say, you know what, God, just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for it all. Amen. Hallelujah. Our pastor's on vacation. Uh, we wish him our prayers. And also like to thank him for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to bring forth God's word to such a beautiful people. At this time, church, I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. And uh, we're going to start with the with our key verse today, and that's going to be, you can find that in the book of Psalms, chapter 51, verses 12 to 13. The book of Psalms, chapter 51, verses 12 to 13. And the word of the Lord reads, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Hallelujah. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, Lord. Not my own joy, not this world's joy, but I want your joy back in my life, God. Hallelujah. With every head bow, let's go into a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you. Lord God, forever and ever, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be in the house, Lord, and for giving us, Lord, the opportunity to come and to give you all honor and all glory, God. Prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls, Lord, for your word, Lord, that you impart in us wisdom and impart in us revelation, God, that, Lord, that you give me the anointing to speak your word in clarity. We love you. We thank you. And the word that the church says in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Church, you may be seated. I was going to start you guys off with standing to a, uh, a 13, 13, script, 13 verse uh, scripture. But I was a little nice right now and just give you the two one. But uh, we are going to read this portion. And it's because uh, we're going to talk about restoration. And there's nothing more right now that we need in this time than a time of restoration. You're going to hear an amen. We can find this portion of reading in the in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 1 to 13. Go ahead and bear with me. I know it's going to be pretty lengthy, but uh, I believe God's going to do something here today. Amen. So 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left hand. All this at eight years old. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work, which in the, is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house." Unto the carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest 
hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbar the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Ashiah, and servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all of Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. And that's how we get... The scripture that we read before, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. You see why? See, King Josiah, he was only eight years old when he began to reign as a king. His father, Amon, was a king that was before him, but his father led everybody into idolatry. All the people of God turned against God. And started to worship false gods and idols. Amen. Not only did they worship them, but they built up statues to even go even further and glorify and bow at their feet. But Josiah was a different young man. He knew what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he did, and this is what he did. Even though his father was total contrary to serving and pleasing God, this was not Josiah's case. There was still some conviction left in this young man. He did not know how he was going to do it. His father didn't teach him the right way. He didn't teach him the right laws that were found in the five books. Amen. But Josiah knew that if there was a way, that God will make a way. Hallelujah. You see, in the course of living for God, people, it is, the po- it is, it is possible to allow some crucial things to slip away. When we're living this life with God, It's easily possible to allow some things to just get out of our sight for just a moment. Prayer life, our fasting life, studying of God's word, church attendance, serving in the ministry. It's possible for it to start slipping away because you are just busy. You are are serving, but you are serving just to serve, not to please God, but just to do it so you become busy. Amen. And then we have that example of Martha. Martha was just so busy wanting to tend to the house and making sure everything was right. But she didn't focus on the one who was present in the house. And that was Jesus. See, revival, it is a time of restoration of those things that have been lost. Josiah was eight years old, the word of God says, when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. See, Josiah is an example of those who choose to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. The culture and society of today has declined unto evil. Amen. Not only has it declined to evil, but even the order, amen, order after order, it is declining and everything is just a mess. Hallelujah. You see, Josiah's times, it's kind of mirroring our times today where everything is just out of order. Not in order with the word of God. Not in order with the truth. Amen. Going in wickedness and serving evil. Hallelujah. You see, the people followed the acts of King Josiah, which was aimed on his father. They worshipped false idols and built statues to them. Josiah has some work to do. This is what was just given to him on the plate. This is all that he had to work with was a stubborn people, a disobedient people, amen. People that worshipped false gods and wanted nothing to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But what a difference, brother and sister. What a difference a decision can make. What a difference that it takes for one person to stand up and to make a change. Amen. No matter what age this young man was, he was, you know what, I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to make a decision that could change the rest of this generation. Hallelujah. Because of a wrong decision by the men to send spies out to the promised land, a whole generation died in wilderness. 
Jonah's first decision found him in the belly of a big fish, amen. But his second decision changed the destiny of the city of Nineveh. Lucifer's decision to follow the dictates of the pride, of dictates of pride, and cast him from a position next to God brought him down to the grave, to the depths of the pit, amen. But Josiah's decision to seek God and rebuild the temple back unto the Lord resulted in revival, resulted in restoration, the discovery of the book of the law and the restoration of the glory of God to the nation of Judah. All it takes is one man, amen. All it takes is one man, one woman, hallelujah, young or old to stand up and say, it is time for change. It is time for restoration. I am sick and tired of going with the flow, routine after routine. I'm sick and tired of seeing my family in despair my family shouldn't have to struggle we shouldn't have to be frustrated amen waking up and just not wanting to get out of bed but it takes one man and one woman amen to get up and to rise up and say you know what it's a time of restoration all it takes is one decision to change the course of your life That's why it's important to count the cost, brother and sister, before any decision that we make. Life is a chess match, a quote says. Every decision that you make has a consequence. Whether it's for good or whether it's for bad. Every decision that you make, there's going to be a consequence. Every decision that you make, there's going to be a reward. See, we do not know who influenced Josiah or how he came to know about the one true God. See, but God sees the hearts of the faithful and he hears the cries of the oppressed. Amen. See, Josiah didn't have anybody to influence and to teach him the ways of the one true God. But there was just something built up inside of this young man. There was just something inside of him that he knew that there was right and that there was wrong. He said, you know what? What we're doing right now, it is wrong. It is evil. And the people are a mess and we are just struggling. What do I need to do? See, we don't know who influenced him. But Josiah made the right decision to cry out and to seek the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, the word of the Lord reads, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. You think a father will let you just continue to go in this world, amen, not serving him? You think a father will just let his child run amok out there in the world and just live a life of sin? But let me tell you that the one true God that we love, he loves you so much that he will bring pestilence among you. He will devour your land and everything in it just for you to bow down and cowl unto him. Because like a father is to a son, no father wants to see a son or a daughter struggle. No father wants to see their son and their daughter not serving the Lord, but he will do whatever it takes. Whether the father has to take away a game system, whether the father or the mother has to take away their allowance for them to get their attention and for them to act right. The same where our God is. Amen. Do you find yourself struggling? Do you find yourself in despair because you are not lined up in the will of God? Maybe God is trying to get your attention and saying, you know what? It's time for you to seek me. It's time for you to get realigned with me because my promise is still there. Your promise, my promise for you is not only for you, but it's for your children. It's for your children's children for generation after generation. It's time to manage up. It's time, amen, for sisters, to you to stand up and to take a stand. It is a time of restoration. Restoration is available to anyone today. If he will turn from his wicked ways and seek the Lord, purge his heart from sin, amen, and receive the Lord's cleansing forgiveness. 
with the ascension of Josiah to the throne of Judah, a time of restoration began. A revival of righteousness in a time of evil, in a time of wickedness. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left hand. Righteousness, it's an abstract term that we have and it's often difficult to explain, amen, and to define adequately and to appreciate righteousness in its entirety. But there are two scriptures that we can read in the Old Testament that it provides us with the insight, brother and sister, into God's expectation for us when he speaks of righteousness. Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. And he brought him forth abroad and, say, and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe or obey to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. The revival that occurred, brother and sister, during the reign of Josiah, it was a revival of righteousness. He believed God. And he obeyed God. Amen. And this is the revival that we need to have in this time. Amen. Because it's like the time of the great awakening. Many people there are in this world and in America and in other countries. Amen. But there's a decline in religion today. But we need a time, a revival of, right, of, of righteousness, a restoration of righteousness back to God, to God's people. Amen. It took for Josiah to seek the Lord. In the eighth year of his reign, at 16 years of age, amen, Josiah began to seek the Lord. See, youth, young adults, 16 years old, and he made the decision, you know what, it's time to seek the Lord. You don't wait till you graduate high school. You don't wait till you graduate or earn a certificate or a degree, or you wait to finish your sports and hoping for a scholarship. But no, it's a time, amen. Today is the day of salvation. Today is a day where I will make the decision to seek the Lord, amen. Because I could only go so long on my daddy and my mommy's faith. I could only go so long depending on my mom and my dad and on their money, amen. There's going to come a time where I'm old enough to leave the house and to explore and adventure in this world. But do you have God in your heart? Are you seeking God to help you make the right decision? Are you seeking God, Lord, help me to choose the right career and to make sure I have the right education? All it was for Josiah was 16 years of age, but he understood that it was time to seek the Lord. When restoration comes from the Lord, the outcome is often beyond our greatest expectations. Joel chapter 2, verse 25 and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Many addicts have lost everything to the canker worm. They have lost everything to the caterpillar and to the palmer worm. They have lost everything to alcohol. They have lost everything to drugs. They have lost everything to anxiety, to anger, to wrath, to malicious. Amen. They have lost everything just for a game of chance, only to find, only to find themselves on their feet, on their face. Amen. Seeking the Lord. And after that, a manifold of blessings of grace bestowed upon them because they decided to turn from those ways and to seek the Lord. Amen. Do I have the witness in the house today that can you say, you know what? I'm tired 
tired of my land being devoured, the land of my family. I don't want it to be devoured no more. I want to be able to reap the fruit that is in my land with my own hard work, not only for me to reap it, but I want my children to reap the blessings of God as well. It is time to turn unto the Lord and say, you know what, God, here I am. Whatever you need to do, Lord, here I am, God. Just strip me away from everything. Strip me away from the carnal mind of the fleshy desires. I have a child that I need to make it to the Holy Land one day. I have a son and a daughter. I have a grandchild, oh God, that I need for them to serve you one day, oh Lord. When Josiah began to seek the Lord, the Lord met him where he was and led him into more truth. The Lord is looking for people. He is looking for a brother. He is looking for a sister who will allow him to lead them into deeper spiritual truths. Amen. God wants a more deeper and deeper relationship with you. A relationship that is intimate. A relationship where you cannot go a morning without seeking the Lord. A relationship where you depend on him and not even your own finances. And you say, you know what, God, whatever it is, God, I know you will get me there, Lord. Me and my family want a home. Oh, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to make a way. Yes, we need to do our part, too. And that is when you have the righteousness of God in your life. You will do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And like a puzzle piece, everything will be put in its proper position. The Lord is looking for someone to say, you know what, God, lead me. Lead me, God. I'm tired of doing it my own way, Lord. I tried my way already, God. And this is where he has got me. My family is struggling, Lord, because of my stubbornness, because of my decisions. Oh, Lord, show me the ways that I need to do, God. And he will tell you, spend more time with me. Spend more time with me in the prayer closet. Seek me more and I will give you these answers. In Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not even know of. Amen. But you need to call unto me. We have so many questions and so many whys that we have for God. But you're not seeking him. You want to accomplish so much in your life. But you're not asking God to show you how. You want to reach a certain destination, but you're not saying, Lord, show me the path that I need to take. We think we could do it on our own. We have degrees. We have a good trade in our pocket, and we have a good bank account that could back whatever we need up to get what we want. But do you have God at the centerpiece? God that will direct your path. God that will show you, amen, and bring everything to light, what is wrong and what is right. Don't go that way, but go this way. Accept this offer. Stay away from that offer. This is what God will do. He will lead you and lead you. He will take your hand and show you, and a life will be amazing. I said life will be amazing. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. The Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah, he began to seek God, the God of his father, David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of all the high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and even cast images. According to the Strong's Concordance, the word translated seek usually means to follow for pursuit or search. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And, it, and every and he who seeketh findeth. And to him who knocketh it shall be opened. It takes for us to do, to be a doer of God's word. It took Josiah to want to seek the Lord. Seeking means you need to pursue God. I'm going to seek God, but I'm, I'm going to pursue him with all that I have. Even if when life throws things at me, no matter what circumstances may arise up, I'm going to continue on my pursuit. My pursuit, amen, to get a hold of God, amen, and to, for him to show me things that I don't even know of. 
In James chapter 4, verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. See, we always wait on God, but in truth, God is waiting for us to make the first step. God is ready to go through it all. He, God is ready to give you everything, blessing after blessing, victory after victory. But God wants to see, is this brother for real? Is this sister for real? Does she really want to change? Does he really want to give his life to me? Let me see him take the first step. And the word of God says that if you draw close to God, he will draw even closer to you. God, I may take one step and two steps to you. That's all I have. And God says, you know what? That's all you need. I'm going to come the rest of the way because I see your one. I see your desire. But we need to draw one to God. If you want to be close to God and for him to be close to you, what are you doing to draw closer to him? Are you spending time with him? Are you taking your time to research the things of God, to studying of God's word? You say, I remember I read a book, and in this book it said, you know what, if the pastor could have as many vacations as he wants if the saints choose to read the word of God. Because if they choose to read the word of God, they will find the answers to all of the problems and they wouldn't even need any counsel. Because God's word is God's word. It's the truth. But we go to counsel because we, we kind of, th we, sometimes we think that maybe pastor would tell us something different. And maybe he will let it, you know, maybe he'll compromise just a little bit. But the devil who is a liar. Thank God for a man of God who stands on truth and on God's word, amen. But if we take the time, amen, to seek God in his word, in his word you will have all the answers that you need. You wouldn't have any questions. You will be able to research and to study and to see God is able to do what he said he is able to do, amen. You see, the great awakening of the 1700s and the early 1800s is now history, but like the history of Josiah's time, it provides us with a pattern for revival. See, during the six years preceding 1800, the church membership of Americans, of America's frontier, it had declined. While at the same time, the population increased significantly. See, this was disconcerting to, to leaders and to members alike. And churches and pastors did not merely just wring their hands and say, you know what, what could we do? We're just going to give up. I mean, people don't want to come to church. They don't want to give their lives to God. But they did not just throw their hands up in the air, these pastors and these leaders. But instead of wringing their hands, they clasped them in prayer, amen. At prayer meetings and at worship and at national conventions, they had their hands folded between one another. And say, you know what, only God could cause this great revival. Only God could cause this restoration. We're not going to give up. Yes, the circumstances, they, they seem that is impossible, but we serve a God where nothing is impossible. We serve a God that is able to do, to do all things, exceeding abundantly above all what we could even ask for or even think. Seeking the Lord is always the first step in any revival. God, we want more revival in our house. We want revival in our home. We want revival in our church. But seeking is the way to start. Seeking God for direction. God, what do we need for revival to start? See, after Josiah sought the Lord, he said, you know what, it's time to purge the land. In his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, of Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Purging the nation of idolatry was the result of repentance and the ongoing process of sanctification. We want to be restored. We want to be revived. But what are you doing to purge out those things that will keep you from reaching the promised land? Are you purging sin from your life, the works of sin, the acts of the flesh? Are you purging them from your life? If you want revival, it's time to start purging. Amen. Josiah used the knowledge he had and purged his nation of those things he knew that were displeasing the Lord. See, regretfully, many Christians, they learn to live. We learn to live with sin because we fail to put, our, put them out of our lives. See, those things we already know are sin. We fail to put them out, even though deep down inside of our mind and our heart, we know they are wrong and displeasing in the eyes of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. 
that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, in fact, it's just the opposite to many. See, the Lord instructs us to put certain things out of our lives. Anything that is from the old man of, or of the world or of the former life that you used to live before the waters of baptism, this is what we need to put out. Amen. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in Knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there was neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, put on holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another and forgiving one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. In all this, be ye thankful. Amen. So don't tell me you don't know how to give your life to God. Don't tell me you don't know what you need to do in order for you to get right in the eyes of God. The answers are right here. He even shows you how to live for him. He even gives you the instructions of what to do. And he says, you know what? You are called to one body. You belong to the body of Christ. Amen. You are not an outcast. You are not an outsider. Being an outsider, you were that. You were that. You were an outsider when you were in the world. Now I have invited you in. I have invited you into my house. And if you allow me to come in, amen. I will sit down and sup with you, and you will sup with me. Spiritual restoration. Spiritual restoration cannot occur until we first purge sin, brother and sister, from our lives and from our congregations. It will less, less, will less be expected of us today to purge everything that is unright in the eyes of God. Luke chapter 12, verse 48, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. Has God given you much? Has God given you much? Has he given you your family back? Has he given you your career has he restored your finances? Has he restored your salvation? Has he restored your joy? Has he restored love in your life when you had no love in your life? Has he restored to you vision when you thought everything was just a disaster and you were just ready to end it? But he blessed you with his mercy. He blessed you with his grace. Amen. Has God given you so much? Much is required from us. Amen. To live for him. To do what is right in the eyes of God. We need to stop being selfish. Start thinking for the, for the generations that are after you. Start thinking about your children. Do you want your children to struggle the way you struggled? You have the key. You have the answers. You know what we need to do, amen. And it's time to purge, amen, to purge sin from our lives. That way we'll be able to have this spiritual restoration. You see, it's a revival, but it's a revival of sacrifice. Josiah knew that it was going to take money for him to rebuild this temple. You see, it came to pass in the eighth year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of, king Je the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered to the people. You see, when Josiah began, the collection process is unknown. But by the 18th year on the throne, there was enough money in the treasury to begin to restore the temple. Josiah was leading the people to revival. Josiah was leading the people to restoration. 
And an important step was the surrender of finances to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 through 21. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Someone needs to say that my treasures are laid up in his kingdom. So my heart is for his kingdom and for his work. Amen. Giving to God, it is a privilege to give to God. It shouldn't be a burden. It shouldn't be, you know, stressful to want to give to God and to his church. Amen. It's, but it's a privilege. You say, you know what, God, you gave me this. You know what, let me give you, let me give you this back. Because I want to see revival. I want to see restoration. Does the church need a new carpet? Does the church need a new sound system? What do we need to do? do the, what finances do they need to do to to go out to the community and to spread the gospel. I may not have the ability to preach. I may not have the ability to sing, but I have the money to back up the work of God and his kingdom. Amen. Josiah seen this. He said, you know what? We're going to do what it needs to take to rebuild this temple. It's not going to be cheap because you don't want to be cheap when it comes to God's work. You want the best for God and for his kingdom. Amen. Because you want, you want the believer, the non-believer to come and to see the goodness to God. You think the people back then, you think the children of Israel just built the, the tabernacle with just scrap pieces of wood? They found the best pieces of wood. They did not get borrowed shirts or borrowed blankets that had holes in them, but they found the best linen. Linen that, that represented royalty and amen and, and, sa and sanctification and holiness. We want the best for God and for his kingdom. It's a privilege to give to God. When it's time to tie, this shouldn't be a burden. God blessed you with the career. God blessed you with the finances. When it's time to give to God, it shouldn't be a burden. You shouldn't be frustrated when you see the ushers walking down the aisle. Hey, brother, come here. I have more to give. Let me give this because God's been so good to me. God's been so good to me and to my family. See, it's a, it's a revival of sacrifice. Not only of sacrifice, not only does it require money, but it requires effort to have revival. The work of God, it requires effort. The restoration of the temple, it would have not occurred on its own. Every revival that has occurred has come about as a result of those who were willing to sacrifice. To those who were willing to sacrifice their time, to sacrifice their talents. Even, even their careers, amen, in order to follow the call of God and act upon the burden for the lost souls. Restoration of the temple, it required effort on the part of a number of different tradesmen, carpenters and builders and masons. And for revival today, we're going to need some fire protection, amen. Maybe some appliances, Eddie. But it requires effort. In the same manner today, obtaining and sustaining revival, it requires the willingness to work and to exercise the gifts that God gives to the body of the church of God. Amen. We have gifts in the house, many gifts and talents, but we are just sitting on them. We just buried what we had and we don't want to, we don't want to express the gifts and talents that God has. Some of us are salesmen, saleswomen that are able to sell it on the, in, the first, in the first move. Selling the gospel to a soul and seeing them being revived. I mean, seeing their life restored. Talents to teach. Gifts to preach, to sing, to serve in ministries. It takes effort. It takes willingness, amen, to see revival in this time. There is no indication that Joshua searched far and wide to find the necessary talents. See, likewise, the Apostle Paul, he stated that God has appointed the gifts necessary in each church to bring about revival. See, it's God's plans, brother and sister. It's his plan for souls to be saved, to be instructed, and to be inducted into ministry. Amen. Some of us are tired of seeing the same minister preach but you're not out there trying to win a soul. 
hoping that one day he will be the next minister, the next pastor, the next evangelist. Some of us are getting tired of the same MC or praise team, but what are you doing to reach out to a lost one, knowing that one day they will be inducted to doing God's work and his ministry? Amen. It is time to look within our congregation and to utilize the gifts, brother and sister, that God has already put here in rest for restoration, for not only for restoration, but that revival may occur it takes effort but it also takes integrity revival or the work of God it requires integrity but they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully imagine that all the silver all the gold they had to rebuild the temple but not one not one person to be over there to see they make sure they spend it right And not try to pocket any. But God knew. And Josiah knew. That these men and these women. They were hungry for restoration. And they were hungry for revival. So they knew. That they were going to act faithfully. Integrity is a virtue. That is tested regularly. In the life of every Christian. However when money is added to the equation. It is tested to its limits. See, integrity is the quality or state of being of sound moral principle, uprightness, honest, and sincere. Everything about living for God is an honor system, including repentance and forgiveness. Amen. Living for God requires an honest living, righteous living, tithing, and even giving. Whenever we are dishonest one one another with one another, we are dishonest with God. Whenever you have hatred between a brother and hatred between a sister or hatred in your own marriage, it's not only to your husband. It's not only to your wife. It's not only to the brother or to the sister. But the word of God says that you are even hating me. You are even disliking me. That's pretty deep, right? It kind of shows us, hey, man, I need to get, I need to get my act together. I got to find some kind of forgiveness in my heart. Because if God could forgive me, if God could forgive me of all the mess that I have caused and what I have made and bring me up out of the muck and the mire and and wipe me off of all the filth and bless me with a home and bless me with vehicles and and gave me the, the ministry that I desire to serve in, how much more do I need to forgive those who have hurted me or have offended me? Or how much do I need to forgive those that have dishonored me or disrespected me? This is what we need to practice. A lot of times revival only requires someone just to forgive someone. Sometimes the blessings in our life are on hold. But you because you choose not to give up that hurt and pain someone else caused you. See, we hear the world say, you know what, I could forgive, but I'm not going to forget. That's a lie from the pits of hell. There's... Didn't the word of God say that when I forgive you, I will take all your sins and cast them to the sea of forgetfulness? Didn't God say that when I forgive you, I will blot out your sins from this book? So much where I won't even know what you have done, what you have, what you have caused. You see, the one who doesn't forget what you did is the devil. He doesn't forget what you did or what you have done. He is the accuser of the brethren. And he'll say, hey, you know what, when you were out with, the, with your buddies last week, you know what you did? And here you are running the aisles, aisles, worshiping God. See, he's the accuser of the brethren. Leave it to him. Don't leave it your, to yourself to remember what someone has done wrong or what they have caused to you, hurt and pain. But just like God forgives, we also need to forgive. Because even the word of God says, brother and sister, you need to forgive your neighbor Seventy times seven. Seventy-seven times seven. Because if you forgive not your neighbor, if you forgive forgive not your brother or your sister, I cannot forgive you. Imagine that. God, forgive me. I need restoration. I need revival. Have you forgiven your brother? Have you forgiven your father, your mother? Have you forgiven the pastor? Have you forgiven those who have hurt you, who have persecuted you? Something to think about, amen. That's integrity. You see, 
R. Kent Hughes, in a, in a book that's called Disciplines of a Godly Man, he offers statistics that compare Christians with non-Christians. And he reveals that Christians are almost as likely as non-Christians to do the following. Falsify their income tax returns. To commit plagiarism. Bribe to obtain a building permit. That's the way business is done, right? Ignore construction specifications. Illegally copy a computer program. Steal time from an employer. Commit phone theft. I know that iPhone 13 is good, but it doesn't belong to you. Exaggerate a product. Tell people what they want to hear. Or selectively obey laws. And these are Christians. People that are supposed to be serving God and doing right in the eyes of God. And they're acting like the old man. They're acting like Egyptians, people of the world. See, I'm going to tell you a story. And it, it, I was kind of put into check. I was young and I was dumb at one point in my life. And uh, I kind of fell under the first one when it said, you know, uh, falsify your taxes. I remember I, I tried to claim someone who wasn't mine. And I was only, I think, 21 at the time. I was trying to claim a 13-year-old as if he was mine. And the sweet lady, she was, like, she was like, young man, do you know what you are doing? You know what you are doing is wrong? I was like, yeah, you know what, but, you know, this is the reward. This is what I'm going to reap. And I'm a Christian. And she was like, okay, look, how about this? Your last name is Salas, and his last name is Jones. How are we going to prove that he belongs to you? And this was a, a non-believer, someone who, who, who probably didn't even go to church regularly on a, on a, on a, daily ba on a weekly basis. But after I left there, I was like, you know what? I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be a man of God. Why do I need to be doing things that are of this world? Why do I need to lie? Why do I need to lie to get more? When God said, you know what? Ask me and you shall receive. I will make a way where there is no way. We need to stop acting like non-Christians and start act acting like followers of Jesus. Amen. If you want to see revival... And if you want to see restoration, it's time to start acting like a child of God. Start acting like a son of God. Start acting like a daughter of God. Be proud of it. Amen. Amen. You want to be pleasing in the eyes of God. You want to make your dad proud of you. God, I want to please you. Whatever I need to do to please you, tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I need to wear. What do I need to get rid of? What friends do I need to stay away? What do I need to do, God, to please you? And you will experience revival. You will experience restoration. Restore unto me, Lord, the joy of your salvation. See, revival of the word. We could never overestimate the value of the word of God. I said we could never overestimate the value of the word of God. Because the word of God brings revival. God just spoke the word one day. And things were brought into existence. God just spoke. Breathed air in a pile of dust, and man was formed. Though we can never estimate the value of the word of God. Psalms chapter 119 verse 9. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Same chapter verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sit against you. And verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Keeping in mind that a revival was already in progress, one can only imagine both the excitement and awe at finding something as the law of God. You see, while the other leaders in Josiah's time were collecting money, silver, and gold to rebuild the temple, there was one man, Hilka, Hilkiah, and he was walking around, he was the high priest, he was walking around the temple that, that has been, that was tainted and destroyed. And the temple that was given to idols. And he was walking around and on his heart, it wasn't the money, the silver and the gold that he was looking for. He knew there was something even deeper. Hilkiah was holding in his hands the key to sustained revival. 
He was holding in his hands that which kept the nation of Judah from sinning against God. He was holding in his hands a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path. Hilkiah, he was walking in this temple and he stumbled upon a book that was just left to the side. A book that was probably covered with dust and maybe was torn on the inside. But he said, you know what, I'm going to take this book. He said, I have found the law and the temple of the Lord. Regardless of the amount of money they collected, the little package in Hilkiah's hands, it was of much of a greater value than silver and gold. See, Jesus told his disciples, are you going to turn away after everything I just said? And Simon said, Simon Peter said, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Never were truer words spoken. We need to value the word of God that we have in our lives. When you study it for yourself or when you hear the man of God preaching the word, value the word of God because it's going to give you instruction. It's going to give you hope. It's going to give you joy. It's impactful. Amen. We must seek truth as we all stand. We must seek for truth, fall in love with truth, and walk in truth. The Word of God says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Revival comes when someone loses the fear of mankind and falls back in love with God and seeks Him with his heart. So at this time, this altar is open for everyone who needs a revival in their home, a revival in their, in their life. This altar is open to everyone who wants a restoration, who wants a great awakening. Amen. See, the great awakening in America, it occurred only after years of prayer and after fasting. So this is your first step. Get a hold of God. Fold your hands and pray like never before. God, these times we are living in, God, they are wicked. But, Lord, I am here in the hour of prayer, seeking you, Lord, for a great awakening. I want to see revival in my marriage. I want to see restoration in my children. I want to see revival in my church, in my community. Oh, God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Return me back to my first true love, Lord. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, sister. Every hand's lifted up at this time. Every hand's lifted up. Go ahead and get a hold of God like never before.